Now let's talk about the effects of strokes in various regions of the brain. You've got a great table here organized by anatomical location, anterior and posterior circulation, and the communicating arteries. Each important vessel is listed on the left with detail about the effects of a stroke there on the right. But keep in mind, test questions will be more likely to give you the symptoms and you'll need to sort those into one or multiple anatomic regions, just like your patients will need you to do in the future. Now, let's start with the anterior circulation. The MCA, as we mentioned, supplies the lateral brain, so the motor and sensory cortices will be affected, along with Wernicke's and Broca's areas. This will give you contralateral paralysis and numbness in the upper limb and face, and possibly hemineglect. Refer back to the homunculus drawing if you need a visual reminder of the face being located more lateral. The ACA is medial, so you will have effects on the motor and sensory cortices that supply the lower limb. Last on the anterior circulation is the lateral striate artery. We haven't mentioned this one before, but it is really critical. The lateral striate is a common location for lacunar infarcts, which are infarcts that occur secondary to long-term hypertension. Because this vessel supplies the striatum and internal capsule, you can have severe hemiparesis and hemiplegia. Now we'll move on to the posterior circulation, where we encounter the medial and lateral medullary syndromes. The medial medullary syndrome is caused by a lesion in the anterior spinal artery, or ASA, which runs down medially and ventrally. Infarction of the ASA affects the corticospinal tracts before they decussate in the medullary pyramids. The medial lumniscus, as it travels from the spinal cord to the thalamus, and also the cranial nerve 12 nuclei. Thus, what lesions would you expect? Well, contralateral hemiparesis, impaired contralateral proprioception, and ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue, so the tongue will deviate to the side of the lesion. Strokes in the pica are known as either Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. They're typically caused by a proximal vertebral artery occlusion. Many nuclei are affected, including the spinothalamic tract and its spinal trigeminal nucleus, the nucleus solitarius and ambiguous of the vagal nerve, the descending sympathetic tracts, and also the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So what do you expect if each of these nuclei are lesioned? Well, vestibular nuclei, of course you'd get vertigo, vomiting, nystagmus, and diplopia. Lesioning the spinothalamic tract would lead you to contralateral loss of pain and temperature of the body. Now, how about the spinal trigeminal nucleus? Well, that will give you similarly a loss of pain and temperature, but the difference is that it will be ipsilateral and will affect the face. Now, the nucleus ambiguous, a lesion there would give you hoarseness. Nucleus solitarius would lead to a decreased gag reflex. The descending sympathetic tracts could give you ipsilateral Horner syndrome, and a lesion in the inferior cerebellar peduncle could give you ipsilateral ataxia. Now the hoarseness we mentioned, which was related to nucleus ambiguous, is quite specific to pica lesions. The last of the lesions in the posterior circulation we'll mention is that of ica. ICA also supplies many territories, so strokes are, can have a variety of different symptoms. Areas affected include the vestibular nucleus, spinothalamic tract, the dorsal cochlear nucleus, the outputs of cranial nerves 7 and 8, the middle cerebellar peduncle, and also part of the cerebellar hemisphere. So, what symptoms might you expect with these sorts of lesions? A well, lesion to the vestibular nerve and nucleus, as we mentioned, would lead to vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. If you were to lesion cranial nerve 7, you would end up with an ipsilateral facial paralysis, but also reduced lacrimation, salivation, taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, as well as loss of the corneal reflex. Lesions in the spinothalamic tract, as we mentioned, would give you contralateral loss of pain and temperature in the body. Lesions to the middle cerebellar peduncle and cerebellar hemisphere, of course, would give you some ipsilateral ataxia. Lastly, the two communicating arteries. Here we have usually berry aneurysms and not strokes, but they're on the same page anyways. 
ACOM aneurysms will produce a visual field defect, whereas PCOM aneurysms generally cause a third nerve palsy. This will cause the eye to go down and out. As we just mentioned, berry aneurysms are very common at the circle of Willis. You can see them in these two different images. Here, radiographically, and here on gross pathology, you see a massive aneurysm underlying the very delicate vessels that compose the circle of Willis. About 30% of berry aneurysms occur at the anterior communicating artery. About 25% are at the PCOM, and 20% are from the ACA. Berry aneurysms are quite prone to rupture, which can lead to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The 